I want to begin this afternoon by saying what a wonderful study we had this morning in Jeff's lesson. I don't know of a much more needed presentation than what he gave. Certainly appreciate his work in the Lord and his ability. But I, I, I really don't, if you kept up with the news, appreciate it enough to give him a $250,000 Lamborghini for Christmas. Now, if you haven't kept up with the news, just forget about it. But if you kept up with the news, you know what I'm talking about. Now that your curiosity is piqued, uh, we'll go to the lesson and see if we can examine something that a very, uh, I don't know more, a more serious matter than to know the truth of God on marriage, divorce, remarriage, because it does have a bearing on a person's salvation. It is not just a pick and choose situation. And last week, we started examining some false doctrines. Jeff and I were visiting last night at the Hayride, and over the years, as these doctrines have come up, we've dealt with them, at least I have, uh, from the time they started, that I knew anything about them over 40 years ago, as they came up. But when I began to put them together, I didn't realize how many there were until I started looking at them one after the other. And when all is said and done, a lot of the people who want to enter into a Matthew chapter 19, 6, God joined marriage aren't too interested in what Matthew 19, 9 says. And they're not too interested in making out formal arguments from false premises to justify themselves in violating God's will on marriage. What you fundamentally will hear is that they have will to be married and they're going to be married. I'll put that in quotes. They're going to be married no matter what and about anything you try to say to dissuade them, to reason with them. And think about what Jeff said this morning about trying to reason with the unreasonable. They're going to do it. Now, if you can catch a person early enough in a relationship to where they're not on this uh, cloud nine, uh, beyond reason, uh, floating in the air type thing, then you might get them to understand you'd better do what God said. You'd better make sure that God's will is being done in this. But when you let things get to the point to where emotions are dominating the whole thing, the cause in a great many areas, not just this one, but certainly this one, is just about loss. But there is a false doctrine that declares that baptism cleanses an adulterous marriage. And again, I know some haven't heard what I've already preached uh, two weeks ago and last week. But to adulterate is to take something that's pure and then add something to it. It's not pure anymore. It's adulterated. So when people say baptism cleanses an adulterous marriage, um, we'll have to hold in mind what we've already studied, and that's most of you. It acknowledges, that is, this error acknowledges the teaching of the Scripture that there is but one single solitary reason for divorce with the innocent party, one innocent of fornication, only being given the right or the authority by the Lord to remarry. And they think that they have found a, a loophole, and we mentioned loopholes last week, a get around uh, the idea of only the innocent party uh, remarrying. It says, that is, this argument says fallaciously that since baptism is for unto in order to forgiveness or remission of sins, all past sins, of course, then those who've made unscriptural marriages, now watch it, those who've made unscriptural marriages, marriage, marriage is contrary to Matthew 19.6, marriage is contrary to Matthew 19.9, those who have made such marriages before, before being baptized are forgiven in baptism and therefore can remain without sin in an unscriptural marriage. Well, those who so argue forget that for baptism to remit one sin 
it must be preceded by genuine faith in Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God. Mark 16, 16, John 8, 24, Acts 16, 31. Also, by repentance from all past sins, Acts 2, 38, Acts 17, 30, and 31. Then a confession of faith in Jesus as God's Son, Acts 8, 37, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If, watch it please, if any of these conditions is lacking, baptism cannot be for the forgiveness of all past sins. And therefore, one is still in his sins. I think sometimes we forget that. Baptism alone does not save anyone from past sins any more than faith in Christ alone saves anybody from sin or confessing Christ with the mouth that he's the son of God alone saves anybody from sins and so on repentance alone won't save anybody from his sins in order to become a Christian if one is living in an adulterous marriage, then in order to become a Christian, that person must meet every one of these requirements, steps in the plan of salvation. And he must repent of any and all sin. That is, he must repent of an adulterous union, just as he must repent of all his past sins, in order for baptism to remit past sins. Without genuine repentance, baptism is useless. This is the reason that I preach sermons from time to time pointing out that the most difficult thing to get people to understand and really do in obeying the gospel is not to understand the teaching of the New Testament on baptism. It's to understand what's required of them when they repent of their sins. So we ask, what is repentance? What does it require? Well, repentance is the breaking down of the old stubborn will of man that's a seat of all sin and rebellion against God. That changes the mind. It is a will thing. And it is brought about by sorrow toward God for one's sins against God. If you can never cause a person to be sorry toward God for his sin or sins against God, it is impossible to bring that person to repentance. It's impossible. Because the trigger mechanism in repentance is sorrow toward God for your sins against him, for your violating his will, for your transgressing his will. Because you see, that caused God to have to give the best of heaven, Jesus himself, and all that Jesus went through to make forgiveness of sins possible. And that ought to tell us something about the enormity and the heinousness of sin in God's sight. If one is a thief, then he must not only stop stealing, he must, wherein it is humanly possible, make arrangements to repay that which he has stolen. One has not repented of sin if he continues in it. Now, you see, this begins to destroy the idea that uh, repentance is just saying, well, yeah, that was wrong, and I'm sorry, but you just keep on keeping on in the violation of God's will. If one's living in adultery, he must cease living in adultery before he can be forgiven. Would anybody want to affirm that the New Testament teaches that one can live in adultery and be acceptable to God? Well, where would you find the scriptures that says it is permissible to live in adultery and you can go to heaven living in adultery? It's not there. Everything in the Bible says you've got to quit being an adulterer. You've got to quit being a fornicator. 
So before one living in adulterous marriage can be baptized for the remission of sins, that person must cease. He must forsake. He must come out of that adulterous marriage he or she is in. That is what repentance requires. And that's the reason so many people who get themselves into an adulterous union, then they learn about the plan of salvation. They learn the truth. They don't want to go through what's necessary that repentance demands in order to be qualified to confess Christ to be baptized for the remission of sin. I've told this story many times before, but it illustrates very, very well what I've just pointed out concerning the Bible's teaching on repentance. The preacher was about to baptize a fellow one night. And as he began to baptize him, he noticed uh, the fellow had his wristwatch on. And he said, you might need to take that off before we go to the water. And as he took it off, he looked at it and he said, well, that's my wristwatch. Somebody broke in our house a few weeks ago and stole that watch. That's mine. The fellow said, that's all right. I'm about to be baptized. So, the preacher being like some preachers are, not quite as sharp as they ought to be, he plunged him beneath the water and raised him back up. Well, of course, everybody was happy. Well, as they began to leave, they walk out, and here's the car the man's getting into to drive off. And the preacher looks and says, well, that's my car. It was stolen the same time my wristwatch was. The guy said, that's all right. I was baptized. And then as the guy gets in the car, the preacher leans over and sees a woman in there and says, well, that's my wife in there. And he said, it's all right. I took her when I stole your wristwatch and stole your car, and I'm baptized, so that's all right. I'll just keep all three. You know, that shouldn't even make sense to, how young can I go? <laughs> but that's the view that says repentance is only saying you're sorry and just keeping what is sinful. You can't do it. You just can't do it. Not if you want to please God. Not if you want to go by the teaching of the New Testament. Sometimes a quibble is made by those who espouse this position. That is, that one can live in fornication or adultery even when they're baptized and even as they live the Christian life. They affirm that adultery is a single act of sexual relations. And once that single act is repented of, the marriage is no longer adulterous. And you notice all of these are working so that you can stay in the, with the woman or man that you have no right scripture to stay with as husband and wife. But I want, without going into a whole lot, and there's various ways to show that's just not the case, but I wanted to notice something in Colossians where Paul's writing to the church now. He's writing to Christians here, not writing to people outside of Christ. In Colossians 3, 5 through 7, here's what the apostle said. Mortify. Now, what does mortify mean? We don't use that much anymore. Put to death. Death means separate. Mortify, put to death, separate yourself. Therefore, in the light of what he had been saying in other verses preceding this, your members which are upon the earth. And then he gives a list of what you're to separate yourself from. Fornication, that's pornea, the Greek word. Covers any illicit sex, that is sex outside of marriage. Put away from yourself, put Put these things to death, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime, now watch, when ye lived in them. Now what does that mean? When you commit fornication and you don't repent of it, whether it's one time or forty times, it is living in that state. And when you enter into a marriage not authorized by God, you are in a continuous state of adultery. Now, what did the Holy Spirit through Paul say to these Christians? Well, he lists all these works of the flesh. One of them is fornication. And whether committed once or 40 times, he said you lived in them. 
your conduct has been contrary to God's word. It's sort of like uh, the command of Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. How many times must you miss the worship assembly before you forsake it? Some, some people, I've heard them argue, argue it to me, saying, well, I only missed once. Well, was that a sin? Well, in their mind, missing once wasn't. Okay, if missing once wasn't, is it two times? Is it three times? Is it four times? Is it half a year? Is it a whole year? Uh, this is still looking up you up here, and I think everybody that comes here regularly knows what that means. You have to have authority from Jesus for doing what you do. Now, let's just say, all right, after five times you have forsaking the assembly, you're living in it now. In a forsaking type of conduct. Well, why would I draw it five times and not draw it one? Or why would I draw the line at ten times and not draw it one? We do those things to ourselves as we labor to deceive ourselves, and even those we call faithful sometimes will do that on behalf of others. Really, only miss one. Well, it may be because he's so sick at home, he's vomited up his insides. Well, everybody knows you shouldn't be assembling when you're in that shape. But it could be also you didn't want to be here that day or something else was more important that you wanted to be somewhere else. Well, you only missed one time, so what does that mean? Watch it. You only fornicated one time in the last year. Don't get too concerned over that. There's a need to repent. He only was in one adulterous union. That's all. Well, how many adulterous unions does it take? How many acts of fornication does it take? How many times does it take to violate God's commandments before God says you're cut off from me and if you die in that state, you're lost or devil's hell? We do those things to ourselves, brethren. And some of us who think we're so faithful make those weak apologies for our own brethren because they only did it once. Where did we learn that only doing a sin once is okay? Maybe you ought to go back and read Genesis and ask Mother Eve. It seems to me it was only one time that she partook of the forbidden fruit before she was separated from God and her body began to die. One does live in a state of sin when he repeatedly commits the same sin over and over again. And it just takes one. That's the first step, so we're saying. It makes it all, to sin one time just makes it so easy to sin the second time and the third time and the fourth time and on down the line we go. But you can see then that that doesn't work with this false doctrine nor any other sin that we might commit. Then there's the idea, the false idea, that adultery is covenant Breaking. Adultery is covenant breaking. And this view says that adultery is not a sexual word. Adultery is covenant breaking. That is the actual sin of divorce. Therefore, if one divorces his marriage partner or spouse unscripturally, that person has sinned because he's broken his covenant has nothing to do with the sexual act. And that person can repent of covenant breaking and continue in any additional marriage or marriages that that person has contracted. And that's the argument made by those folks. And you see, it all comes back to say, I found somebody I want to be with. The Bible forbids it, but I want to be with them so strongly, I'll figure out a way. I'll figure out a way to do it. I think it's been well said that if one allows a man to define his own terms, he can prove anything he wants to. That's why in formal debate that one must define his proposition. It's in the definition of that proposition where you find out what a person means and what he's affirming or what he's denying. This is a plain case I think, of giving common, well-known terms a new meaning in order to give credence to one's theory. 
Funk and Wagnall Standard Desk Dictionary defines adultery as follows. The voluntary sexual intercourse of a married person with someone not the spouse. Unfaithfulness, unquote. The same dictionary defines fornication as voluntary sexual intercourse between unmarried persons, unquote. Vine, in his dictionary, expository dictionary of New Testament words, defines the Greek word commonly translated adultery as follows. Quote, denotes one who has unlawful sexual intercourse with the spouse of another. And then in, he then cites Luke 18, 11, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, and Hebrews 13, 4, unquote. That same book, Vine's, defines the Greek word translated as fornication in the New Testament as follows. Quote, use of illicit sexual intercourse. And he cites a number of scriptures. It stands for or includes adultery. It is distinguished from it in chapter 15, 19, and Mark 7, 21. Metaphorically, of the association of pagan idolatry with the doctrines of and professed adherence to the Christian faith. Revelation 14, 8. Chapter 17, 2 and 4, chapter 18, 3, and chapter 19, 2, unquote. Now, you can go, most of you have vines, or a lot of you do. You can look that up and read it for yourself. Adultery and fornication always have been known to refer to sexual unfaithfulness. Only in a figurative sense might they be used to describe covenant breaking, such as God's use of it, in reference to Israel when they had broken his covenant. And Jeremiah points that out in Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through 14. However, the definition of a word must be based on its literal usage. Context will then determine if it is used in a figurative sense. Uh, I always define context in which a word is used to be the environment in which the word finds itself. And to illustrate that, I'm still me, but I'm an environment standing here that would be somewhat different if I was the same me standing outside. And that would especially be true back in August. I would be the same me, but I assure you the environment would be different. And so it would be with you. Context will determine if it's used in a figurative sense. That's why that rightly dividing the word of truth, learning how to ascertain Bible authority, learning how the Bible authorizes, learning the definition of words, learning how that, it takes time. But if you want to go to heaven, that's all you have time for. You realize that, don't you? The only reason we have time is to get ready to go to heaven. You think about that? From the time you're born to however long you live, Every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month is all given to you so you can find the truth of God's Word and get ready to go to heaven. Now, if you're using it for everything else under the sun, then when the sun's gone <laughs> and the world's gone and the universe is gone and time is gone, then you flunked the course of life and you'll hear, depart from me, I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. So it's clear from the context that fornication and adultery both occur in the marriage passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke that we've noted earlier in the literal, generally accepted meaning of the words. So that's just a dodge when it says adultery is covenant breaking and doesn't involve sexual acts. It does. Now there's another, and that is that Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9 is covenant legislation. This is another attempt to circumvent God's law of marriage, divorce and remarriage, in the Christian age. And we must understand it just falls into line with the rest of saying, here's what I want to do, here's what I know the Bible says, I like what, what I want to do, so I'm going to justify myself in what I want to do, though it's contrary to what I can read the Bible says. It only applies to those, though, that is, the people that use this, to those who are in covenant relationship with God, and that means only to those who are already Christians. This means, then, that before one becomes a Christian, 
He could contract one or 100 marriages which were not in harmony with the principle stated in Matthew 19, verse 9, and he would not sin in so doing. He could obey the gospel with marriage partner number 2 or 20 or 100 and remain with that partner with God's blessing since the marriage was contracted before God's marriage law applied to him. It's simply saying God's marriage law, stated Matthew 19.6 and Matthew 19.9, doesn't apply to anybody unless he's already a Christian. So you see, whoever you're with as your spouse, uh, when you're married or when you're baptized, then you can just simply stay in that condition. But there's nothing in the context of Matthew 19.9 to indicate that Jesus' law was not of universal application. Nothing. Jesus said, whosoever. If words have meanings, the meaning of whosoever is as broad as the human race. And he says, whosoever shall put away his wife. The language is similar to John 3, verse 16. And it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So just as whosoever in John 3.16 applies to anyone in the world who believes in Jesus, guess what? So whosoever in Matthew 19 verse 9 applies to anyone in the world who puts away his marriage partner. When the scripture says that Jesus has all power or authority in heaven and on earth, that means that all people are amenable to the authority of Jesus Christ as set out in the New Testament of the Christ. That's the reason that in the Christian age, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Now, if... What is being said here, this error, is true, then what I've just said only applies to members of the church. Only those who are already in covenant relationship with Christ by being baptized into Christ for the reach of sin. Well, then let me ask you, what about all of these people, and that would be most of them, who never obey the gospel? What standard is going to judge them? There's not going to be any standard. But the problem with that is, is that where there's no law, there is no sin. So how does a person become a sinner? Since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. If people outside of Christ are not amenable to his law, how do you become a sinner today? And you become a sinner today by violating the law that you're amenable to. And what law is that? The perfect law of liberty. The standard by which Jesus shall judge all men on the day of judgment. When, as Paul said, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body. According to what standard? According to the standard, the New Testament standard. Jesus' law of marriage is simply God's original law given to all. All, all mankind in the beginning. Its application is as universal today as it was when first given. That's the whole point of the first few verses of Matthew 19. Is to say, there were some things allowed as the scheme of redemption was developed throughout the Old Testament. But with the coming of the kingdom, the way marriage was set up in the beginning is going to be restored. And that's the way it's going to be. And so Jesus even asked those that said, well, why did Moses give in the writing of divorces? Divorcement. And he tells them. It was for the good of the wife because you hard-headed men, if you couldn't get rid of her, you'd kill her. If Jesus' law of marriage does not apply to all men, I, I simply have to ask, what about the rest of his laws? Do they only apply to those in a covenant relationship with him? Does not one have to comply with his laws to enter that relationship? If you don't have to comply with the Lord's laws to enter into a saved relationship with him, whose laws are you complying with to enter into a saved relationship with him? Well, it seems to me the Bible talks about obeying the gospel, the glad tidings, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's God's power to save, Romans 1.16. It's to be preached to every creature. What kind of creature? A sinning creature. What's to be preached to them? The gospel? Why? It's God's power to save. 
And people must believe and obey the gospel. Whose gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ. So how could one comply with laws which do not apply to him? So obviously Jesus' gospel applies to men outside the kingdom, outside the covenant. Because you see, then when we're baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, Paul tells us we're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27. Sin is a transgression of God's law. How many times have we said that? 1 John 3, 4. However, if God's law does not apply to one not in a covenant relationship with him, then how could one be guilty of sin for one cannot break a law to which he is not amenable? Obviously, God's law applies to all men. For Paul said, all sin come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Again, and I know we're doing a lot of emphasizing here, but we need to push and press the fact that the law of Christ is universal. I said earlier, Christ has all power or authority, both in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28.18. So his gospel is for who? All the world. Every nation. Every creature, Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 47, Acts 1, 8. Every one of those verses covers each one of those terms. All men everywhere commanded to repent. All men everywhere, Acts 17, 30, and 31. Who's left out? Therefore, all men must be guilty of sin. If you've got to repent, you have to be guilty of something. But since sin's a transgression of God's law, then all men everywhere must be amenable to God's law. Some have supposed that before one becomes a Christian, he's subject only to civil law. When he obeys the gospel, he's then subject to God's law. Others have theorized that before one obeys the gospel, he's subject only to some imaginary law of the heart. But once he's obeyed the gospel, he's then subject to the law of Christ. But I remind you that sin's the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Now, what law is that? Civil law, which would be man's law. A law of the heart. And nobody's ever been able to fully describe what they mean by that when they're trying to get around obeying the truth regarding marriage, divorce, free marriage. Or would it be that sin's a transgression of God's law. Well, that's what John said. And the Holy Spirit guided him to say it, and he was an apostle of Christ, 1 John 3, 4. So man is subject to God's law even before he obeys the gospel of Christ. And that being the case, then Jesus is teaching in Matthew 19 on marriage, divorce, and remarriage is binding upon all men everywhere. And thus, when they stand before the Lord in judgment, they will give account of the deeds done in the body on the basis of the standard of judgment, which is the New Testament system. There's several more, but time's getting away from us, and I want to introduce another one this day. Um, it's sad that when it's easier to understand what Jesus said than it it is to understand some of these things. I hope we presented them well enough to where if you want to understand them, you can. And thus, if somebody comes up sometime with one of these false doctrines, one or more of them, that you'll recognize them for what they are. But let me say this in closing. You remember two weeks ago, we spent the whole sermon just on understanding what the Lord taught on marriage, divorce, remarriage, when a person is married, and so forth. If you will understand that and have that well in hand, then when you hear anything else that's contrary to the teaching of our Lord on that, you will know it is not from heaven but from men. And you will know that people are trying to circumvent the teaching to get around the teaching of our Lord himself. And whether you can answer them in every detail doesn't make any difference. Any more than you know how the fellow who made the counterfeit bill did it all. You'll still know it's counterfeit. That it's designed to get around the Lord's teaching. And you'll know to run from it.
If you're not a child of God this afternoon, there is but one system of salvation. That is the New Testament system. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. That way, that truth, and that spiritual life is set out only in one place, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. If you turn a deaf ear to a part or the whole of the New Testament system, you will remain lost in your sins, and you cannot go to heaven when you die. Jesus plainly said to the Jews of his day in John 8, 24, He meant no words, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Remember the force of the clause of exception? Except means if and only if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is there any hope of salvation? It does not teach. That's the only step in, pl in the plan of salvation as we've studied. Nothing only by itself alone saves you. The Bible saves us. The love of God saves us. The gospel saves us. Hearing the word saves us. Faith in Christ saves us. All those things in their proper place saves us it is the complete obedience to what God obligates us to do that saves us from past sins at a given point and places us in the Christ and that is immersion in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins but that won't do it if you haven't believed in Christ repented of your sins and confessed your faith in him then you're qualified to complete your obedience to the plan of salvation in being baptized into Christ. Then in living in Christ, the Lord has something to say about how you live in Christ. That is, to be faithful to Him in the church. You're not just baptized into Christ with your past sins remitted, then you can just do as you please. The Bible plainly says, written to Christians in James 1, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty... And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. That ought to be kept in mind as to what is faithfulness in Christ, and if I am faithful as a child of God. If you're not faithful as a child of God, then repentance is demanded, as we studied earlier. Confession of one's sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. Now you see then how far-reaching repentance is when it comes to changing your life and divesting yourselves from those things that you have no scriptural authority to possess. All the way from wives and husbands to property to bad language, dirty jokes, not visiting the sick and afflicted in their afflictions, the orphans and widows in their afflictions, or any other thing. The worship assemblies? Well, I only missed once. Try that on the day of judgment. It won't work, folks. When I purposely know the truth and know I can set it aside, I have shown God I don't respect His authority, I don't respect His Son, if I can get by with breaking it one time, I can figure out a way how to break it several times. It won't work. Don't believe it. So if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.